what it means to be a spare. The recent past has redefined the word spare for us in a way we, in America, and in fact most of the world, never expected. Of course we all know it means extra like having an extra toothbrush, or tire but having an extra human being. That was new to us. The extra human being thing hit me like a bolt of lightning when I discovered that my wife was being unfaithful and I was her spare. My discovery came when my executive officer came into my office, closed the door, and asked me if I knew who Jody was. I was stationed at an army base in Georgia, and my job was commander of the soldiers who were permanently assigned to the base. The base was a training facility so had a constant rotation of soldiers who were there for either 8 or 12 weeks depending on their course of instruction. All training bases had cadre who were there for an average of three years. Those permanently assigned soldiers consisted of the medics, the military police, instructors, mechanics, and other support staff, and were housed separately from the trainees. Those were my soldiers. To assist me, I had an executive officer XO and a first sergeant, who was usually referred to as top by the soldiers because he was the highest ranking sergeant in the unit. Even I called him top in all my casual or informal dealings with him. On official or formal occasions, I called him first sergeant. My top was the epitome of a military man. He lived and breathed the army and was very protective of his soldiers. On more than one occasion, he made it clear that I was the boss in name only. The soldiers in the unit were, as I've already mentioned, medics, mechanics, instructors, etc. Those were their daily jobs, but they were also soldiers, first and foremost, and it was the first sergeant's job to not let them forget that. Top was the person who made sure their military needs were met. Things like their professional training, PT physical training was scheduled and conducted, career development planned, and on and on. He was also responsible for housing those soldiers who chose to live and eat in the barracks. In the German army, the equivalent position was sometimes referred to as the father of the unit. My top was not only a father figure, but also a trusted confidant when needed. It was not unusual to see him out of his office and around the base visiting his. Soldiers in their daily work environments. My XO, on the other hand, was a dedicated student. Although he was an officer, he spent a lot of time working on those military correspondence courses that he thought would serve him well when it came time for promotion. He also took lots of classes at the on-base education center. He was determined to reach the highest rank someday. He never shirked his duties because with a first sergeant like ours, he didn't have a lot to do. His name was Dennis White, and he held the rank of first lieutenant in casual situations. I called him by his first name, but due to our rank difference, he always addressed me as either Major or Sir. He was married to Elise, who was the daughter of a colonel. It was he who encouraged Dennis to get as much education as he could. Dennis was pretty straight-laced and not given to idle chit-chat or rumors. In fact, I was surprised that he knew who Jody was. So, when he asked me about him, I was more than a little shocked. Jody was the name given to men who seduced the wives or girlfriends of soldiers, usually those soldiers who were serving away from home, but not always. The name was prominently mentioned in some of the cadences soldiers sang while marching. Of course I know who he is. Why do you ask, I answered. Three weeks ago, Elise was playing bridge at the club, the officer's club. Another wife at the table next to hers was talking about her neighbor's son. She said she and her husband were at a pool party at the neighbor's, and the son was bragging to a group of men about spending time with the wife of a soldier. Apparently, he was not a fan of the military and had no idea one of the men he was talking to was in. The Army. The idea that he could spend time with the wife of a soldier regardless of the soldier's rank not only spend time with her, but have an ongoing connection, seemed to please him greatly. He apparently didn't know a private from a general, but the fact that she was married to some unintelligent grunt made him happy, so he bragged about it to anyone who would listen. His parents heard him and told him to stop. The last thing he mentioned was that he and she had been spending time together for several months and the unintelligent. Husband had no idea. He sounds like a weirdo, I said. Yes, he does. Finally, his father took him inside away from the guests. The father returned alone and apologized to his guests, who, with the exception of the military couple there, were civilians the wife was the one Elise overheard. It is not unusual in towns and cities that host military bases for members of the military to live among the civilian populace as there is generally not enough housing on the base to accommodate the service members and their families. 
This happens for all branches of the military. As commanding officer of the permanently assigned soldiers, I had a house on the base. How old was this guy, I asked. He goes to college, so 19, 20 or so. It wasn't common for military spouses to have affairs, but it wasn't unheard of, either, so I told him. It happens, and I feel sorry for the poor husband. Do you know if she is the wife of an officer or enlisted person? I hope it isn't one of our soldiers. I can't even imagine what that must be like. I don't know, but you usually think of it happening to enlisted wives, but Jody manages to get around there are many more enlisted than officers, so we hear about it more, but proportionally, it's probably the same. Cheaters cheat, regardless of what rank they or their spouse has. I just feel sorry for the one cheated on. Did Elise get any idea about who the wife is no name, but she got a couple of clues he hesitated. The affair apparently started because the braggart had taken a friend to the emergency room at the hospital after he had a medical emergency. They both sound like terrible people, I said facetiously. A big blowhard who may or may not have been telling the truth, and his troubled friend make a visit to the hospital. Jeannie sees guys like that almost every night. Jeannie was my wife and worked the evening shift at the emergency room of one of the two hospitals in town. Yeah, well, maybe she saw those two that night, he paused again. The son described the emergency room nurse as a slightly heavier redhead with green eyes. That sounds like Jeannie, I said. People like that come in so often that she has stopped mentioning them, he continued. Anyway, the guy laughed when he told about a tattoo she had of her father on her left shoulder and he described their physical connection a certain way and laughed as he looked at the tattoo and thinking that her father was watching her. It was at that point in his story that his own father had heard enough and apparently was embarrassed so got him away from the group of men he was talking to and took him inside the house. I sat there frozen. Jeannie had a tattoo like that. Her father died at a relatively young age. Her favorite picture of him was as a five-year-old. In tribute to him, she had the same image tattooed on her left shoulder, but only a handful of people knew about it, and even fewer had actually seen it. She was just a few pounds overweight and described herself as heavier, and was very conscious of it, so rarely wore a bathing suit or clothing that would reveal either her body or the tattoo. The tattoo was deeply personal to her, so in order for the man to have seen it, she would have had to have shown it to him. Logically, that would mean she had to have been in some stage of undress. At least that's what my common sense told me. I sat looking at him, neither of us knowing what to say. I'm sure it was obvious from my reaction that something unusual had happened. Until then, he was just describing the coincidence of a nurse who fit the same description as the wife of his commanding officer and friend. Major? Sir? What's wrong, he asked. I heard the phone ring in the outer office. It was called the orderly room and was where the company clerk sat. The clerk served as typist, file clerk, receptionist, and general helper for the XO, first sergeant, and me. A couple of seconds later, our clerk stuck his head in my office. Excuse me, sir, but the general wants to see you right away. Regardless of what else was happening, when the general summoned you, that took precedence. I'll be back as soon as I can, I told Dennis as I got my hat and headed for the general's office. On the way, my mind was cluttered with thoughts. What did he want to see me about? Did I miss a due date for some important report and the general wanted to talk to me about it? Was it even Jeannie the guy was talking about? How could it not be her? How many heavier red-headed nurses with green eyes work in the hospital? And how many of them have tattoos of their father on their left shoulder? I was not much of a believer in coincidences. On and on my thoughts went, even during the meeting with the general. I have little recollection of what we discussed, because my thoughts were consumed with my wife and her tattoo. I strolled back to my office, taking my time. When I arrived, Dennis greeted me. What did he want? Oh, nothing important. Do we need to take any action now? Nah. I'm actually taking the rest of the day off. Let Top know when he returns, yes. Sir Jeannie waved goodbye as she drove off while I pulled into the driveway. I took out my phone and called her. I thought you had tonight off, I did, but I offered to cover for Linda. She wanted to take the evening off, she replied. What about dinner? You can make something. See you later. Bye. This wasn't the first time she had volunteered to work for someone else in the past few months. In fact, if I went back through the calendar, I would see that it was the seventh or maybe even the eighth time. I did the math in my head. Three months equals 90 days. 
She worked her regular schedule for five days a week, so that's 60 out of 90 days. She hadn't taken any days off, even when I asked her to, but had worked, from what I remember, those extra seven or eight days. Let's assume it was seven. So, she probably worked a total of 67 out of 90 days. Adding to that, she had been out in the evenings at least six times for various reasons that didn't involve me. These thoughts started to make me wonder if my marriage was experiencing some issues. Thoughts that I didn't want to entertain, but all pointed to the same conclusion. I could dismiss the fact that she worked alongside a red-haired, green-eyed nurse in the emergency room, as there could be others like her. Maybe not at her hospital, but in general. Her work schedule could also be justified as part of daily life. I could also understand her going out with colleagues or friends without including me. However, the tattoo was too specific. It seemed unlikely that it was all just a coincidence. There had to be something more to it. So what do I do now? Ignore it. That's not an option. The probability of her cheating couldn't be ignored. Confrontation? Maybe. I could tell her what I suspect and let her respond. But what would happen after? Would she have a reasonable explanation? Admit to an affair? Laugh it off as mere coincidences? I had no idea, but I remembered something I learned while growing up. As a child, I often heard my father mention Occam's razor when faced with a problem, but I never fully grasped its meaning. It was only years later in a college philosophy class that I truly understood it. Occam's razor is a problem-solving principle that recommends looking for explanations with the fewest possible elements. It's often paraphrased as the simplest explanation is usually the best one, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. Darn it. With that in mind, I spent the evening considering different courses of action. By midnight, I was exhausted and clueless. I was lost in thought when she arrived home at two in the morning. Why are you still awake? She asked. I have a lot on my mind. Is there anything I can help with? She quickly added. Are we getting transferred by the army? Would it be a bad thing if we did? Yes, it would. We're settled here, and I don't want to leave. If they do decide to move us, we won't have a choice. Have you ever thought about taking a short tour? Would that be all right with you? A short tour is also known as a hardship tour, where the service member goes without their family. It usually lasts about a year and often takes place in locations like Korea and Afghanistan. These aren't typically places one would choose to go voluntarily. Probably. If it means we can stay here, you do realize that I wouldn't be sent back here once I return, so what would be the advantage? Can I get you something to drink, she asked, changing the subject and ignoring my question. I let it go. No, I'm ready for bed, I stood up. Are you coming? No, I'm not tired, I shrugged and headed for the bedroom. As far as I knew, the army had no plans to transfer me, but the topic suddenly seemed to be on her mind. It might be useful. Two days passed and I hardly saw Jeannie. However, I was in a deep funk, causing everyone to ask if I was feeling unwell. On the third day, Top entered my office, closed the door, and sat in one of the chairs, as was his custom whenever it wasn't an official visit. All right, what's weighing on you, I inquired. It's not about what's on my mind, it's about what's on yours, what's going on nothing. Why do you ask, don't give me that? Major Top always called me by my full name and rank Major Anthony Tony Edward Clarkson. I've been in the army for almost 19 years and I've seen it all. Either you're being discharged, transferring and your wife doesn't want to move, she's presenting a different problem, or there's some other personal situation. Which one is it? Quite perceptive, I must admit, but my personal life was none of his business. And don't say it's none of my business. The way you interacted with my soldiers makes it my business. If you don't want to talk about it, fine. Either sort yourself out or take a leave until you can. I don't want your attitude affecting their morale is that all? First sergeant I addressed him that way to assert my authority as the boss. He stood up. Yes, sir. But remember, I know a lot of things. Things that might help you when you're ready. You're a capable officer, but more importantly, you're a good person. Don't let something you can't control ruin your life. Take charge. You can't change the past, but you can make sure it doesn't happen again. And who knows? You might even get some satisfaction out of the process with that, he saluted and left. I almost smiled after he left. That was his way of looking out for me. I spent the next two days pondering over his words. Take charge and you can't change the past, 
but you can make sure it doesn't happen again and who knows. You might even get some satisfaction out of the process. The following day, I called both Top and Dennis into my office and instructed the company clerk not to disturb us. All right, here's the deal I began. What I'm about to share stays between the three of us. If any of it gets out, I'll know it was one of you, and if that happens, you'll both be in trouble. Top, the XO told me about a conversation his wife overheard. It involved an army wife being unfaithful to her husband. Dennis, your description of the wife could match many wives, but it was the tattoo that stood out. Do you remember the tattoo, yes sir? Top, the wife had a tattoo of her father when he was young on her left shoulder. I paused and took a deep breath. Okay, this is the difficult part. I believe that wife is my wife because she has the same tattoo. I can't imagine there being more than one red-haired, green-eyed, emergency room nurse with that specific tattoo in the city. Well, darn it, exclaimed Top. Oh, no, Major. I'm so sorry, sympathized Dennis. Now my problem is how do I either prove or disprove it's her? And if it is, what do I do about it? The three of us are intelligent, so together we should be able to find a solution without the whole post finding out. I don't want to walk around with everyone knowing that my wife cheated. There was a knock on my door. I explicitly said we were not to be disturbed. Yes, sir, you did, but it's Colonel Bradford. The general wants to speak with you, okay? Thank you, I picked up the receiver. Major Clarkson speaking, sir. Tony, this is Colonel Bradford. Hold on for the general. There was a brief pause while the general got on the line. Generals typically don't call majors and wait for them. They have someone else on their staff make the call and keep the junior officer waiting. Major Clarkson, I'd like to come down and tour your facility and have lunch with you, your XO, and first sergeant in the dining facility. Are there any conflicts that would prevent that? No, sir. It would be our pleasure. In other units I've been in, a member of the general staff would schedule visits like this, but this general preferred to do some of them himself. He seemed to enjoy interacting with the soldiers. He and Top were both old school soldiers in that regard. Great, see you in about an hour, yes sir. What was that about, asked Dennis. He heard my side of the conversation, but not the general's, so I filled them both in. I better let everyone know that he's coming, so they can tidy up the barracks, said Top. Our offices were located in the same building as the enlisted barracks and dining facility, which was formerly known as the mess hall. We operated differently from other units. Most soldiers worked and trained as a unit, with the same duty hours. They all had day jobs, and the barracks were typically empty during the day. We were different. Since we were permanently assigned to support the post's training mission, we operated 24-7. That meant that at any given time, there would be shift workers in their rooms either sleeping or enjoying their time off. The doors of these soldiers had signs indicating they were sleeping, so they wouldn't be disturbed. As a result, those rooms often appeared lived in and weren't always inspection ready. However, the rooms were expected to be ready for inspection whenever the occupants left for their shifts. Everybody, including the general, knew this, of course, and took it into consideration. Good idea. In the meantime, if you have any suggestions about my situation, I'd be happy to hear them with that. We went our separate ways to prepare for our visitor. I went to the dining facility to have the dining steward, formerly known as the mess sergeant, set up a VIP table. The lunch went well, and several soldiers got to chat with the general. They enjoyed it, and so did he. After he left, Top asked if I had a few minutes. I have an idea, he started. The best way to find out if it is your wife is to have someone keeping an eye on her. Now, I know you're not in a great financial situation, but hiring someone to watch her constantly would cost a fortune, but maybe you could do it yourself. I've thought of the same thing I said. Good. Great minds think alike, he smiled. The XO and I can handle this place for a couple of weeks. Why don't you tell her you're going TDY temporary duty as a member of an inspection team, or some other thing, but take leave and track her yourself? That way, you'll be able to satisfy yourself if she's guilty or not, and no outside people will be involved. If you need help, the XO and I can pitch in, and it stays in the family I had considered the same thing, except I hadn't planned on involving him and the XO. Type me up a leave request starting tomorrow. Make it for 15 days. I'll clear it with the general, he smiled. Yes, sir. 
working the hours Jeannie and I worked was its own problem. At least five days a week I left home early in the morning and got back in the late afternoon. She left in the afternoon and got home late at night. That didn't leave much time to spend together, and there was no doubt that our relationship suffered. We had been living like that for the two years we had been stationed there. We kept hoping her hours would change, but the day shift nurses had seniority so she was relegated to the afternoon shift. We figured she would be able to get the day shift at some point, but that hadn't happened. The worst case scenario was that we had one more year to deal with it before we were transferred and we could try to get back to a normal life normal for a military family, that is. Again, we thought the challenges would be worth it in the long run, but it appears that maybe we were wrong. Apparently, her work shift was not the worst case scenario we thought it was. If the signs I've had so far are true, her infidelity would be. Our social life suffered, but our emotional connection was the biggest victim. Sometimes we went weeks without intimacy, but I never once suspected that she would cheat. Never. We talked about the future and being able to have enough money to travel and do all of those things that retirement would provide and her working full-time. Even dealing with not being able to work day shift would help accomplish that. I told the general I had a family situation to deal with, and he approved my leave. That night I packed a suitcase, waited for Jeannie, and told her the first lie I ever told her. I've been chosen to be part of a TOE table of organization and equipment evaluation team and will be leaving in the morning. As far as I knew, no such team existed, but it sounded good. On such short notice. Yes, I'm replacing someone who had a family emergency lie number two. How long will you be gone two weeks lie three? Where are you going Washington for? Okay, stop counting. I told her that since Washington was just a few hours away, that I was going to drive. We then talked about what needed to be done in my absence before we went to bed. To sleep. Not one mention of any romantic activities. She was still asleep when I left the next morning. I drove across town and had breakfast since it was too early to check into a motel. Then I drove to the car rental location, parked my car, and got in the rental. I had planned in detail what I was going to do and how I was going to do it, but while sitting in that restaurant facing it in real life, I was almost overwhelmed. I knew she took the same route to work every day, so that would be no problem. I could see when if she deviated and that would be easy. Watching her in her workplace was impossible. This was not going to be easy. I suspected she might not wait to go to work at her regular time, so I was sitting outside the main gate of the base at mid-morning and watched as her car was waved through by the security guard. She followed her regular route for the first few blocks, then made a turn when she would ordinarily go straight. She slowed and appeared to be looking for a place to park in the middle of the local university complex. There were no parking places on the street, but a car pulled out and she quickly replaced it. I watched as she parked, got out and hurried up the street. The driver behind me honked his horn because I was sitting still and blocking traffic. I looked in my rearview mirror at him waving his arms wildly. His lips were moving, probably cussing me, but I couldn't tell. It only took a couple of seconds to look at him, but when I looked back to see where Jeannie was going, she had disappeared. I drove around the neighborhood several times trying to see her, but no luck. I continued driving around until a parking place opened near her car and facing in the same direction. I thought that if I sat and waited until she left that I could follow her. After three hours, I had to use the restroom after four, I had to pee badly. I didn't want to give up my parking space, so I hurried down the street to a construction site. There was a portable restroom there that I used, then rushed back to my car hoping she hadn't left. At that thought, I started laughing at the situation. If she was with another man, how could I be hoping she was still with him so I could follow her when she left? It was a moot point because her car was still there, but some other cars were gone. Apparently, classes were over and the students who drove to class were gone for the day. At seven in the evening, I saw her and a man, and I used the term loosely because he seemed more like a kid, walking toward me, hand in hand. I knew she wouldn't recognize the car, but if she glanced my way, there was no way she could miss seeing me. I started the car and pulled into traffic. She didn't pay any attention to me because she was looking at her companion. I only moved a short distance and pulled into another parking place. I got out and went back up the street in the direction they were going. They walked another two blocks and went into a pizza restaurant. 
The smell coming from there reminded me that I was hungry. Directly across the street was another pizza restaurant. We were in the university part of town and pizza was the main food group of students. I went across, bought two slices and a soda, and went back to my car, assuming they would come back this way when they were finished eating. I was right. Less than an hour later I saw them coming back down the street. I got out of the car, crossed the street, and looked in a shop window. The shop sold all things pertaining to the university. I turned and watched as the two of them stopped at a car where the man slash child she was with took something out of it before continuing to walk. Another block and they went into an apartment building. I wrote the license number of the car they stopped at and returned to my rental. I had to use the portable restroom two more times before deciding at midnight that she was most likely not going to leave, so I went to my motel. I probably could have saved some money and slept at home in my own bed, but decided against it. I also decided that the evidence was pretty clear that she was having an affair. It was also pretty clear that working the hours we did was most likely the cause, or at the very least contributed to the cause, of the cheating. So, now what? The next morning I drove by and her car was still parked in the same spot. I wondered if I would accomplish anything by sitting there another day. I hadn't made up my mind, but she did it for me. The two of them came rushing down the street. He was carrying some books, so I guess he was going to class. They stopped at her car long enough to hug before he scurried down the street. She got in her car and made a phone call before driving off. I followed her back to the main gate of the post and watched as she was waved through. I went back to my motel. The commander of the military police detachment and the civilian security service for the post was a first lieutenant. I called him. Lieutenant Daniels, if I had the license number of a car and I wanted to find out who the owner was, can you do that for me? Or is it against the law? Ordinarily, sir, you have to have a reason to go into the system to get that information. That prevents stalkers, perverts, scammers, and other unsavory characters from getting it. Why do you ask it's a personal thing, Lieutenant, no big deal? Give me the number, Major, and I'll see what I can do. I don't put you in the same category as the bad guys thank you, Lieutenant, I gave him the number. Ten minutes later, I answered my phone. It's Lieutenant Daniels, Major. The owner's name is Frederick G. Wingard, his address is... Lieutenant Daniels also gave me Wingard's phone number. The address was certainly not the apartment building where the car was parked. It was in one of the nicer parts of the city. I assumed that since he was a college student, the address belonged to his parents. I then went on a social site on the internet and found 15 Frederick Wingards but only two had the initial G. The first one I checked lived in our city and the picture was of the same guy I saw Jeannie with. I read all about him and it was all about him. He was an egomaniac. I did this and I did that and I did it better than this guy and I lasted longer than that guy. And my new car was more expensive than Joe's or I held my breath longer than Judy and on and on. But the most interesting thing I read was a dialogue about his hot girlfriend. He called her red and she's red in all the right places if you know what I mean. No. What do you mean ask someone named Ted? Don't go there said JC. JC? Janie Clarkson maybe? Simon, red, everyone knows what that means. Ted's just being funny. Yeah, I'm just joking around. Everyone knows he means you have red hair on your head and in your armpits. Right, Freddy? Right, except she's red one other place. Two, oh? Where would that be Freddy dot 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 die if you ever want to see or get near that place again? You'll end this conversation, said JC. LOL. Okay, sweetie. Sorry, Ted. That's okay. Maybe she's just sensitive. Wow. Yes, she's sensitive. And in all the right places. LOL, you weirdo, said JC. If you keep telling the public about it, I'll stay home from now on. With a weirdo asked Freddy. Yes, and he's not a weirdo. He's just not what I want anymore, OMG. Red is married, said Ted. No wonder she's sensitive. Oh, come on, said JC. Now you've done it, Ted. Now she's mad. You started it, Freddy, yeah. Well, that was a mistake. I'm out of here. I have to make amends and apologize. Is her apology worth it? Asked someone named Lucy. Another of Freddy's 1,427 friends. Yes, it is. It's big and impressive, and you would be jealous. Would I like to apologize to her? Asked Lucy. LOL, you certainly would. Anyway, I have to go and make it right with her if she won't accept your apology. 
give her my phone number, said Lucy. It was like reading private text messages or watching a reality show. Were there no secrets anymore? And if JC really was Jeannie, being so open went against everything I knew about her. And her saying, oh, come on to Ted, was relatively new. She knew and used the word, but rarely. What's next? If JC is able to participate in a conversation on the internet, she must have her own site. I looked and there it was. No picture, no personal information, and only one friend, Freddie Wingard. She obviously had the site solely for the purpose of communicating with him. But why? Why have an almost public site when text messages were so convenient and much more private? The short answer was most likely Freddie's ego and him wanting it known all over the internet. What a weirdo. That plus the fact that I had access to her phone and could possibly read their texts, but a second phone would be so much easier. Possible answer was, again, his ego. I know nothing about psychology, but maybe he needed to let people know he had a girlfriend and she was married. After all, he blabbed it at the party Dennis's wife overheard it being discussed, so why not let the world know about it on a social network? And he called me a weirdo? Goodness, that's the pot calling the kettle black. The next question is, why would Jeannie tolerate it? Tolerate it. Goodness, why would she cheat in the first place? As Hamlet said, A, there's the rub. So what happens now? At two that afternoon, I was, again, waiting outside the main gate when she left. I followed her, again, to Freddie's apartment building, and if it was like the day before, she would be there the rest of the day and all night. I remember wondering how many of the past 67 days she was supposed to be working that she spent here. The night before was probably their first all-nighter because she was never away from me at night. It seemed that having taken 15 days leave was unnecessary. My mission was accomplished in two thanks to their rather careless attitudes, back to my hotel and my computer. Look up divorce and find lots of information, most of it bad news for the husband, regardless of the circumstances surrounding the divorce. Wife cheats, husband gets hurt by the courts. Irreconcilable differences? Husband gets hurt by the courts. Wife runs off with another woman? Husband gets hurt by the courts. Gosh, I obviously couldn't stay married to a cheat. So how was I going to divorce her and not lose more than half of what we had? If we lived in a community property state, things might be easier. As it was, who the heck knew what would happen? A search for an attorney took another three days of my leave. I hadn't talked to Jeannie in five days. I had made no effort to call her and she, likewise, had made no effort to call me. I saw no need to try to follow her anymore. The attorney I decided on was about 90 and looked like a really old Santa Claus, but there was nothing jovial in his demeanor. Do you want to get revenge on her or just end the marriage was his first question after I told him my situation. I don't know was my reply. I would like to find out what I did or didn't do to cause her to cheat. I understand, but in my experiences, there is no single thing that causes women to cheat. Men, on the other hand, can become cheaters quite easily. If a man is inclined to cheat, all it takes is a woman to show a bit of interest in him. Of course, there are those men who would never cheat, but they're rare do all women cheat. Oh, goodness, no. And the ones who do need a reason. And that reason is generally psychological or emotional or a combination of the two. A man just being handsome and available doesn't do it for most women. Something has to be lacking for them to cheat. Not that they are justified regardless of the circumstances. I'm just saying that cheating is... Much more complicated for a woman, so where do we go from here we file the papers? All I need to know is what do you want to show as the reason adultery, of course without proof, all she has to do is deny it. Isn't her spending the night in his apartment enough proof, not if they say all they did was play checkers? Or talk about how big a weirdo you are. Unless there are photos or video, you'll never win. Then I'll get proof. Then I'll wait to file the papers. Any ideas how you're going to get it, none at all I left his office and sat in my rental. I was paying for that car and a motel and was conflicted. I wanted to turn in the car and go home, but if I did that, I might lose an opportunity to catch her in the act and prove adultery. It was the fifth day of my leave. Saturday would be day six, and I wondered if Jeannie would be home. Mid-morning Saturday I drove by his apartment building, and they were standing outside. It looked like they were arguing. I kept driving. That evening, Top called me and asked to meet me at my office. 
You know I coach a little league baseball team, right? I do. Yes. We were playing a game this afternoon. One of our players slid and hurt his ankle. His parents and I took him to the emergency room. The doctor saw him, gave him a couple of aspirin, wrapped it in an ace bandage, and told him to sit out the next week. We were waiting for his discharge papers, and someone came in the cubicle next to us. It was a man and a woman, and I overheard part of their conversation. It wasn't difficult, there was only a thin curtain separating us. Anyway, I heard the man and he sounded upset. He asked if she was going back to her other boyfriend, the weirdo. Her reply was angry, and she told him to not call him that. Then he laughed. I heard her go shate, and he lowered his voice, but I still heard him. He told her she needed him, and that she would be back. She said shate again, and told him she didn't like him talking like that. He sounded mad and told her if she didn't like it she could go back to the weirdo boyfriend and stay. Then someone else came in and told them to knock it off. The third voice said that Jeannie should take her personal problems in life and keep them out of the hospital. Then our nurse came with discharge papers. I whispered to her about the voices, and, in her own whisper, she apologized and said that one of the nurses was having trouble with another of her boyfriends. We signed the discharge papers and left. I looked in their cubicle as we went by it, and it was your wife, and some guy did she recognize you, he had been to our house a couple of times, nah. I was wearing my uniform dot 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 baseball uniform, not my army one, and she wouldn't know me from the man in the moon. Anyway, we were almost out the door, and he stormed out and just about knocked me down in the process. That pretty much ended our conversation, and he left. I just sat there. Other boyfriend. I didn't have to wonder who the other boyfriend was him or me. He was spending time with her I wasn't so it was obvious who the other boyfriend was. If they were arguing earlier in the day when I saw them and again, or rather still, when Top saw them she might have gone home. When I left the office, I drove by the house to see if I could see anything, but the house didn't have lights on inside. I then drove through the hospital employee's parking garage and her car was there. I went back to the motel. At the motel, I turned on my computer and went to his social page. There were a few general comments about school in red, but no conversations like last time. Her page was different. Again, I couldn't understand why they used this venue and not text messages, but there it was and it had happened earlier that day. I'm really mad at you, said JC. It was a joke. I'm sorry messing with me is no joke and I'm tired of telling you but I, but nothing. You weirdo. I'm really mad. You waited until I was tipsy and you took advantage. I told you I was sorry that doesn't work anymore. We're finished, that's ridiculous. All because of a joke trying to mess with me is no joke, okay? Okay, no more. I promise you're right. It's over between us. Come on, Red, don't contact me anymore. Listen to me. Be at my apartment tonight after you get off work and be ready for a confrontation or by tomorrow morning your husband, or should I say, backup partner, will know about us. You wouldn't do that. Oh, wouldn't I? I have nothing to lose except a worthless person. You, on the other hand, have a lot to lose, you weirdo. Yes, I'm a weirdo, but I'm the one who will expose our secret. After that, you can do what you want. Their conversation ended, and I just stared at the screen. Jeannie strongly disapproved of a particular act. I had never tried it because she asked me not to, and up until recently, I loved her enough to honor her request. Frankly, that act never interested me anyway. He had used the word backup again. The word had recently received widespread attention, and not necessarily in a good way. An heir and a backup have apparently been used in aristocratic circles for a very long time to ensure an inheritance stays within the family. In my case, I was the backup, but not for inheritance reasons. I had become a backup partner for Jeannie in the event her primary one was no longer available, which apparently after tonight he would no longer be, but neither would I. Then I remembered something else Top said. The discharge nurse told him that the nurse in the next cubicle was having trouble with another of her boyfriends. Another one. How many did she have? In the motel, I was still looking at my computer screen. I took out my phone and took pictures of the conversation I just read. I might not be able to catch them in the act, but a copy of this conversation might work. Of course they could always claim it wasn't them. I thought about my next step. It was a given that our marriage was over and I had no reason to help either of them, but I was thinking. 
I could tell her I knew about them and she didn't have to go to his apartment that night, or I could say nothing and let her face the consequences, or they could even reconcile. If they did, I might still get pictures or video of them together. I decided on another option and took out my phone. She answered when it rang. Hello, Tony. What's up, she asked. We finished early, so I'm on my way home. I'll be there in about three hours. I won't be there. I'm working. I know, but you'll be getting off in a couple of hours. Not tonight. I volunteered to work another shift. I just sat there. Tony? You, there, I'm here. Okay. I guess I'll see you in the morning. Okay. Drive safely by no. I love you. No. I'll be happy to see you nothing. I went right to her social page to see if she tried to contact Wingard, but there was nothing. I thought she might try to cancel going to his house after work because I was coming home, but if she did, she did it by phone. And I think she lied about working overnight because the hospital had a rule that no one worked back-to-back -back shifts unless it was an emergency. She just told me that so she could go to his apartment. So fine, let her go. I had given her an excuse not to, but... I checked out of the motel and went home. My phone rang at four in the morning. It was Lieutenant Daniels, the commander of the military police detachment. Madge. Clarkson, we have your wife at the detachment office, sir. The local police got her for DUI, but when they found out who she was, they brought her here instead of arresting her and throwing her in the drunk tank to sober up and go before a judge. I know you've been on leave, but the gate guard reported that you came through the gate last evening and I'm glad you did. You can come get her and nothing will go in the official log. Thank you, Lieutenant. I'll be right there. The local police were very good about things like that. Unless someone was injured or property was damaged as a result of the drunkenness, they either brought the culprit to the base or our MPs or security people went to retrieve them. All in all, it was a good deal for everyone. I'd seen her tipsy before, but never drunk. And when she'd been tipsy, she was jovial and happy. Drunk, she was irritable and resentful. She didn't want anyone to touch her. Of course, if Winger did to her what he promised to do, I could understand why. I was tempted to have them keep her in the small cell they had, but decided against it. It took several minutes to coax her to the car because she wouldn't allow us to physically help her. When I finally got her home, she made it as far as the living room sofa before collapsing and passing out. I looked at her and thought of the last five years. We'd had a good life with the potential of it being even better in the future. Worldwide travel, adventure and excitement at all would have been ours. Maybe the whole thing was my fault. It was me who insisted she keep working even though the hours were tough. Maybe I had tunnel vision and was selfish asking her to sacrifice. Nah. Most couples had to sacrifice one way or another, and the majority of them did it without one of them deceiving. By then it was after six in the morning, I showered, shaved, put on my uniform, and went to my office leaving her there to sleep it off. I had gotten a cup of coffee in the dining facility and chatted with the head cook. It was Sunday and the dining steward was off. Several soldiers were having breakfast, but Sunday mornings were usually pretty slow. It was generally the best day for eating in the dining facility because the cooks were able to spend time experimenting with recipes and honing their craft. I hung out for a few minutes before going to my office. My desk was clean, so there was nothing there I would need to concentrate on the next day. Apparently the XO and top had taken care of everything, which didn't surprise me. I sat there for an hour before going home. Jeannie was still asleep when Lieutenant Daniels pulled up in her car around mid-afternoon. I went out to greet him. I hope you don't mind, he said. I thought you might be otherwise engaged and not have time to pick up her car, so we got it for you. Thank you, Lieutenant, but who's the wee Sergeant Handy and I, or me, I never know which is correct. Anyway, here's her car, and what happened to her, doesn't show up on any report Sergeant Handy, was sitting in his own POV privately owned vehicle. I waved to him. Thank both you and Sergeant Handy, I said. It was very kind of you. Do you know where she was when she was stopped? Yes, sir, I do. She was sitting in the intersection of Cary and 3rd. She had apparently stopped for the light and fell asleep while waiting. Fell asleep. That's a nice way of saying she passed out, isn't it? He smiled. Yes, sir, and handed me her keys. Thank you again, Lieutenant, you're welcome. Sir, they left and I went back inside. It was good she was stopped when she passed out, otherwise some real damage or injury could have occurred. The rest of the day was quiet I watched TV while she slept. 
By 11 that evening, I was still watching TV and waiting for her to wake up. During the course of the evening, I had looked over at her many times wondering how long she was going to sleep. I went to bed at midnight. I was in the shower at 5 to 30 the next morning not having gotten much sleep. I had looked in on her before my shower and she had been asleep almost 24 hours. I took my laptop and was in my office at 7, my usual hour. I asked Top to sign me in off of leave and back on duty. I brought both him and Dennis up to date on what I'd seen and done. I opened my computer and went right to Wingard's social page. It was filled with more of his bragging and his conquest of a virgin rear which he ruined and enjoyed watching Red having to get intoxicated to take his member in her rear. He even laughed at her discomfort. The behavior of that weirdo made me sick. I almost felt sorry for Red until I remembered who she was. There were lots of comments from his friends and only one of them thought what he did was funny. Most of them criticized him for being sadistic and mean. Quite a few said they were no longer going to be friends with him. Dennis and Top left me alone the rest of the morning. The last thing I did before going home at noon was to call Lieutenant Daniels. Jeannie was still on the sofa, but sitting upright. We just looked at each other until I spoke. How many, how many, what men? How many men have you been intimate with in the last five years? I know of two others besides Wingard, but what's the total? I didn't know if she had any others, but the hospital nurse referred to her boyfriend, so I guessed. She just looked at me. I don't know what you are talking about, really. Then who treated you that way yesterday that you had to get intoxicated to cope with it? She sharply turned her head towards me. She started to say something, but caught herself, then calmly asked. What are you talking about, Jeannie? I know what happened. Can't you just admit it you're crazy? Okay, maybe I am crazy, but you cheated on me and I'm filing for divorce. You can ask Frederick G. Winger to help you move your belongings out and into his apartment or wherever you want them to go, but you need to leave this place. I looked out the front window and saw a military police car pull up. Lieutenant Daniels had come through for me. There will be an MP posted here until eight tonight. You and all of your stuff better be gone by then, or you'll be arrested for trespassing on government property. I knew it was a risky threat to make, but considering the number of men she had been involved with, I figured it was worth a shot. You're crazy. I've never done. That, and you can't kick me out of my own house. This isn't your house. It belongs to the people of the United States. They're just letting us stay here because I'm in the army. But since I'm getting a divorce and won't need it anymore, someone who deserves it will move in. Tony, I don't know what you're talking about. Where did you get the idea that I was having an affair Wingard told me? He's the one who exposed you, but how can he do that when nothing ever happened between us? I laughed. So you're saying you spent most of last week with him? Alone in his apartment overnight. And nothing happened, Tony. Where did you hear all of this? I don't even know anyone named Freddie Wingard. Freddie, yeah, that's what you called him, no. I called him Frederick G. Wingard, it's the same thing if you say so anyway. Even if I did know him, I never slept with him. I never said you slept with him. You were probably just too busy, but you did spend several nights at his apartment with him. All I want to know is how many nights she jumped up and winced in pain. Oh, darn. What's wrong? Are you hurt? Forget it. I told you. I have no idea what you're talking about. This conversation is going nowhere. The bottom line is you're moving out. Today. Or you'll end up in a federal jail tonight. She was beginning to realize I meant business. Tony, listen to me. I haven't cheated on you. Ever, and you still insist you don't know Wingard, I swear I don't. Janie, I saw you with him. I saw you holding hands with him. I saw you eating pizza with him. I saw you going into and out of his apartment building with him. I even saw you hug him fine. Maybe I know him, but I never slept with him. Do you really think I'm that stupid? I also saw both his and your social media posts I paused. The MP will be posted outside until 8 tonight. If you are still here, he will arrest you and you'll have to see a federal magistrate. I'm leaving and I'll be back at 8.01. Take as much furniture as you want, but leave the government-issued items, Tony. Tony. Tony, but I had already left. At 7.45, Lieutenant Daniels called me to inform me that she was gone. Two young guys, college-aged, arrived in a pickup truck and trailer and moved her out. She handed her house key to the MP on duty before getting in her car and driving off. 
she left a note for me. Tony, I hope you get to pursue all the things that are important to you. They were never important to me. They were your dreams, not mine. I grew to resent the army and the life I had to live because of it. I was secretly hoping you would be transferred somewhere I couldn't go so I could plan a divorce and a life without you. You can file for divorce, but I will counterfile due to the emotional cruelty I have endured in this marriage. Jeannie. I filed for divorce and she countered, but my attorney asked Wingard for a statement and he eagerly provided one. My attorney convinced him that it would make him popular to admit that he seduced an army major's wife and with his ego, he jumped at the opportunity. The statement revealed that he had an intimate relationship with Jeannie for over four months. He claimed they met at the hospital when he accompanied a sick friend. According to him, they started talking, and he sensed that she might be interested in going out with him. His intentions were purely short-term pleasure. She was older and married to an army officer, making her more appealing to him. He had a dislike for the military but couldn't explain why he just didn't care for them. In addition, he stated that she had described me as a nice guy, but dull, and he never wants to have any fun. She also mentioned that she enjoyed working the night shift because it allowed her to meet other men, especially young college students. My attorney asked him to provide explicit details about the night he deceived her and how he used the threat of revealing their affair to control her. The more specific, the better my attorney instructed, his demeanor less jolly than I expected. Wingard shared all the explicit details he could recall. He went on for several pages about that particular incident and others, describing when and where they engaged in intimate or inappropriate activities and how much she and other women reportedly enjoyed it. In fact, most of his statement was centered around how skilled he was and how he was apparently the best lover she or any other woman could have. He saw any resistance as a sign of his prowess. My attorney informed me of the statement. I chose not to read it, but the police did, and he was arrested for blackmail, extortion, and assault. Jeannie didn't read it either. She was confronted with its contents but stopped reading shortly after starting. She dropped her countersuit, and we never had to go to court. The divorce was granted, and we moved on with our lives. I am nearing the end of my three-year tour here and have received orders for Germany. I'm excited about spending three years there as a single man. Top 2 has received his orders and a promotion. He will be going to Germany as a sergeant major, the highest enlisted rank in the army. Dennis will be taking over my position for a year before being transferred elsewhere. I've heard Jeannie is still working the late shift, but we haven't seen each other or spoken. Three years as a bachelor in Europe. I'm going to have a lot of fun.